but I'm really excited uh, to be introducing our speaker today. Uh, Sean graduated HSU's history program with me, and so, uh, you know, I, I know him to be a first-rate historian, and he his knowledge in this particular subject is absolutely unsurpassed. Uh, he has helped me in so many ways in doing research on the local railroads. I, I couldn't count them. Not to mention his, he's active in so many preservation efforts, working with the THA. He's been on the board of the Humboldt County Historical Society and the Timber Heritage Association for the past several years. Um, he's a Eureka High School teacher. He teaches two of my favorite subjects, history and auto shop. So you can't say no <laughs> things about Sean Mitchell, and he's going to tell us today about uh, the absolutely fascinating history of the NWP and its demise. So thank you, Sean, for joining us, and uh, take it away. Okay. Um, thank you both. Jim, that, I think you oversold me, dude. That was a lot. <laughs> Um, but I really appreciate it, and I just, I'm hoping that everybody can hear me. Um, it's funny, because I've actually been teaching online for the last few weeks, so I do this a lot with my students. Thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Everybody got me? Okay, fantastic. Um, in a minute here, I'm going to share my screen, uh, so I won't be able to see you anymore. But, yeah, just a little bit of background about me. Um, I started researching this railroad back in 2009 or so when I moved up here. And I pretty much just became fascinated by it. I think it's always interesting when you see infrastructure sort of fall apart. And boy, has this one fallen apart. So um, there's a lot to see here. It's going to take um, probably well over an hour, but I'm going to try to make this uh, happen as clean and concise as possible. Um, I'm really happy to see some of my friends in here from THA. I see coworkers from Eureka High and other friends. So, and to all new people that don't know me yet, um, Thanks for joining us. This is super exciting. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and yeah, just get started right here. So the title of my presentation is actually the same title as my um, article that I had published in the Humboldt Historian back in 2014. Um, so the title of it is Fire in the Mountain, the Beginning of the End for the Northwestern Pacific Railroad. Um, and just a reminder, uh, my name is Sean Mitchell. Um, I am very active on this Facebook page that I run with my friends Josh Buck and James Bradas, who are the only two that they have more knowledge of NWP than I do. I'm just good at putting things into PowerPoints apparently. <laughs> um, so we have that, and then also um, the timberheritage.org website, definitely check that out. I am a board member of that organization, and I feel really strongly about what we're working towards, hopefully an excursion train one day. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I want to just very quickly go over some of the photo credit and the thanks um, to various people who have helped me with this. There are so many amazing resources online um, that you sort of have to search for when it comes to NWP. Um, but see, these are some of the most notable ones. And I just want to be clear, any of the photos that I found in here uh, without credit, because sometimes they just drift around on the internet, um, all the credit is reserved to those phot photographers. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be 29 this year, so I was not around very long while the railroad was still running because it shut down in 98. So just a big thanks to all the people and places that have helped made this possible. So let's talk about why I focus on Island Mountain. So this is Island Mountain. This is the original bridge that stood over the Eel River. Um, that is the tunnel in the background. This is an NWP passenger train. Uh, this could have been an excursion special, but anyway, that's one of their famous 10 wheelers. And you can see the tunnel portal. That is the west portal. Um, the tunnel is 4,300 feet long, and it's just an incredibly scenic and beautiful part of the railroad. This is a little bit later. This is 1997. Uh, Dan Hauser, I saw he's in this meeting. Hi, Dan. Um, took this amazing photo in 1997, and it really just, I had to include it. I have to include it in everything I publish because I think it's so beautiful because it's kind of like the sunset is um, coming down on the Island Mountain Bridge, 
And I think a lot of people in 1997 and 98 didn't realize that the railroad was also going through its own sunset because just about a year later, it would shut down. So I was actually able to visit the Island Mountain yard and um, tunnel and bridge. So this is the actual uh, yard right here. And then back there, you can see the bridge that goes into the tunnel. So this train is still trapped there. And we're gonna talk about it. Um, this is actually taken from about 100 feet above the earth. Um, I did go down in a helicopter. I had a really awesome opportunity to do that. And we flew basically from uh, Fortuna all the way to Island Mountain and back. And I just could not believe the amount of damage that has happened on that railroad in just the short, um, at that point, it was about 16 years since it shut down. So this is the train that's still trapped down there. We're gonna talk about that in just a little bit. This is a pano that I took of the Island Mountain Bridge as it stands today. Not a whole lot has changed, although a lot of this area is actually threatened by fire right now. So we're not really sure what's gonna happen to the Island Mountain Yard in the next um, few days, basically. So hopefully it survives. Um, hey, Corinne, I just wanna check in. Uh, seeing this okay? Everything looks good? Yep, looks good. Okay, thank you. So um, this is the North Portal some 4,300 feet ahead of that south portal that I just showed. Um, it's funny because when I presented this in um, Redway, I think that was last year, maybe the year before, um, the guy that actually lives in that house on occasion uh, came to the presentation. I got to talk to him. He actually used to work for the railroad. Um, and this area is just so special to me because I actually got to write about it and then eventually go down and actually visit it. So that's me with the article from the Humble Historian. And again, there's Dan's photo. So let's talk for a second about the isolation of Island Mountain. It is 30 miles east of Garberville. It's technically southeast of Garberville. It is mile post 194 of the total 305 miles of the railroad from Napa Junction all the way up to Samoa through Eureka. It is 55 railroad miles east of Willits and 61 railroad miles west of Scotia. And it really is in the heart of the rugged Eel River Canyon. Um, and it's worth noting that SP Convention, that's Southern Pacific, the parent railroad, um, actually stated that all trains leaving San Francisco were headed east, east, and all heading towards San Francisco were heading west. So when you read publications or uh, stuff from railroaders at the time, they would say eastbound, westbound, that's just the convention. So this is roughly what Island Mountain looks like above. I think that image is a little distorted. It is a satellite image from Google Earth. But um, that little B marker, that is right at the end of the bridge going into the tunnel. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of perspective. So it's beautiful and scenic, but incredibly rugged. So let's zoom out. There's the terrain. So the tunnel actually cuts directly through the spine of this mountain and it exits somewhere about here. There's this interesting oxbow in the river. Zoom out just a little bit more and you can see <laughs> the geology of the Eel River Canyon. Let's go out once more. There it is. Um, it's so difficult to get there that I only know a few people uh, post-1998 who have been there. Uh, one of them being Josh Buck, who I saw was in this call. Hi, Josh. Um, he floated from uh, basically upstream, downstream, and was able to actually go get pictures of it. I was lucky because I happened to meet someone who had a helicopter. So nowadays, there's not a lot of ways to get down there. It's pretty much by the one private road, which we don't have keys to. Um, floating down the river or by aircraft. And pretty much all of those options are equally dangerous nowadays. So this is a photo that I took. You can see at the top, it says 1918. Uh, that portal was built just a little bit later than the railroad was finished. The actual tunnel was completed in 1913. Um, here's a photo from the very, very beginning. This is a historical society photo. I think Jim got this for me. Um, you can see workers actually walking up to the portal and I would guess that the tunnel is not finished yet because you can see there's no light at the end of the tunnel yet. 
Here is another early photo. This is probably from the teams, um, right around the time that the railroad was completed. It's really beautiful. And notice this is the first bridge. You don't see the big girders yet. So this is a photo from 1964. And I included this because there's a few things here that are pretty spectacular. Number one, love those diesels. Uh, those are, I believe those are SD7s, possibly SD9 locomotives. Um, but this is an excursion that was a, um, it was a special charter that was from the Bay Area up to Eureka and back. And you'll notice a few things. Number one, this is the first bridge, doesn't have the big girders. You will also notice that there's something interesting on the tunnel portal. It's kind of like a rolled up little tube. Uh, that's actually a fire door. And we will talk just a little bit later as to why that's important. And note the date. This is September 27th, 1964. Uh, from what I have read, the NWP was never in better shape than it was the summer to fall of 1964. Which, if you lived in Humboldt or studied any Humboldt history, you know that 64 was a pretty monumental year for this county. Oh, and I should tell you also, this is the only part of the railroad that is technically in Trinity County. So this is a little bit later. This is a comparison to the later bridge. Uh, this one was put up after the 64 flood, and that's a Eureka Southern GP38 going southbound, or we would call it westbound. And this is a photo from the North Coast Journal. Um, a few years back, they published an article, I think it was called like Disappearing Railroad Blues, I believe. Um, and this is one of the uh, old coaches that actually was dumped into the river. I believe that's the one that actually used to be a schoolhouse. I'm not positive. Josh could probably tell, tell us that. So um, why did Island Mountain spell the end? In 1978, the tunnel was closed for 15 months. This was the event, in my eyes, that spelled the end for the profitable operation of the NWP. It was the beginning of the slippery slope which led to the ultimate permanent shutdown in 1998. I'm gonna go ahead and just make sure that there's nothing in the chat box. Okay, um, so let's just do a quick background on the Northwestern Pacific. Um, I'm actually not here to tell you the entire history of the railroad because you could honestly read so many books about that, um, but I really want to just give you a short background so that we understand the later years. So the NWP um, was honestly one of the most scenic railroads in California, definitely in the country. This is the uh, Scotia Bluffs. This is another, I think this is a 1949 excursion. Um, it is a little insane when you look at this trackage and notice that they actually built it on the side of some of the steepest sandstone cliffs that we have in our county. Um, Many people have shared the story about this, but there's basically a land dispute between um, the people that, it was actually, uh, Jim can say more about this, Lorenzo Painter um, of Rio Del, and they ended up having to build the tracks across the river, and this was a pretty terrible idea. But it did last until about 1998, not without issues though. So this is just an overview of the entire route. You can see that it basically ran from the North Bay um, all the way up to Eureka, and it did actually at one point connect all the way to Trinidad, which is something that a lot of people don't realize. We had a railroad all the way to Trinidad. <clears throat> it's worth noting also that if you drive through downtown Eureka and you see what is now apparently supposed to be the Marina Center one day, uh, what is often referred to as the balloon tract or the balloon track, there was actually an entire NWP facility there at one time. Um, if you look right here, and if you take a gander on Google Earth, that turntable is still there. So the turntable was actually how they would turn locomotives around. Uh, contrary to popular belief, they were typically um, placed in the roundhouse nose in, um, not usually nose out like they show in all the pictures. Uh, so they did have a roundhouse. There was a maintenance facility there. They would do light maintenance, um, rail car work. They'd probably work on the wheels and the locomotives. I don't really think they did any big overhaul jobs there, but they did have a full you know, maintenance facility. 
And I think it's really interesting to see where roughly where the, um, what is this, the, not the Adorney Center, I'm blanking, uh, the Warfinger Building, um, this entire area here used to be a large rail yard. So it's just a little, a little bit remarkable to see how much things have changed because all of this is now pretty much just field. The mainland track does still go through town and there's about, there's four locomotives still there and just one rail car left. So I also, yeah. Um, someone was asking what the date of that balloon track photo was. Oh, thank you. Um, so that is from the Schuster collection. I want to say probably about 1946, maybe 1947. Uh, this Schuster collection from HSU pretty much goes, at least for the railroad stuff I've seen, has pretty much gone from about 1945 or so, 1946, up to about 1954. Um, and the other thing is you can actually look and see what type of locomotives are there in Eureka. And to me, this tells me that it's probably the forties because there's still steam engines. Thank you. Um, so this is another thing that should be noted. Um, there was an entire yard facility and even a turntable in Tiburon. Um, if you looked at modern photos of this area, it's all high end housing. There's nothing left of these facilities. And I should mention also that engine right there, number 112, I actually got to sit in the cab of it um, earlier this year because it's down at the Sacramento uh, State Railroad Museum. And it's the last remaining NWP steam locomotive. Um, it's well out of service at this point. Um, it's just basically stored for uh, preservation at this point in this photo. This would be in 19, I'm going to say this is early 60s. Um, and I just love this photo just to give you an idea of how, how times have changed. That's the same engine. There's a number 112. It's actually crossing the uh, grade crossing at Alliance right there in Arcata. And then in 1989, you can see the North Coast Daylight passenger train with the Eureka Southern engine. It's probably doing a switching move right here because that was part of the Y where they could actually turn trains around. And then finally, at the end, you can see 2012. The rails are buried and they're mostly paved over. In fact, throughout most of the county, a lot of the crossings are paved over and out of use now. And that was eight years ago. That crossing, uh, crossbook is still there. So, uh, 1907. Um, in 1907, the NWP as a company came to existence. So back in 1903, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, the ATSF, created the San Francisco and Northwestern Railway. It ends up controlling the main line from Eureka to Shively. In 1907, 45 different railroad companies from Marin County to Trinidad consolidated, and they actually formed what we now know as the Northwestern Pacific Railroad Company. Um, it ended up becoming a joint ownership between ATSF and Southern Pacific because they realized that there was no way they were going to fit two railroads through that Eel River Canyon. They could barely even get one to work through there. So it's worth noting also, all lumber and other products coming to or leaving Humboldt before 1914 actually had to cross the mouth of Humboldt Bay. Um, of course, there were people that went, uh, you know, overland to the stage route, but it took a very, very long time. And we know that in 1914, it was pretty difficult to move things by carriage. Um, also, I should mention that if you've studied anything about Humble County, especially how it was settled by white Europeans, we know that the main reason why people came here was because of its abundant resources. And this includes uh, Redwood. So in this case, this is North Fork. So that would later on be called, um, it's like the, the Corbell area basically. Uh, so this Redwood stump was 22 feet in diameter. Um, and you can see there's an entire, I think that's an entire class of school children standing on top of it. So old growth redwood was really the thing that fueled the development of NWP. I like to include some pictures of some of the other railroads in this area. Um, like I said, there were 45 different companies, but not all of them had actually laid track. They were just, uh, in some cases, just property names or business names. Uh, but this one actually existed. So this is the Oregon and Eureka Railroad. This engine, the number 11, was actually the first or the largest engine north of Sacramento to be built um, at this time. This is in 1910. And that engine was built right in the Samoa shops where uh, Timber Heritage now is building 
it's where we're building our museum. Um, I also think it's worth noting that we did have a pretty extensive railroad network, um, even beyond just the NWP. Believe it or not, this is Clam Beach. Um, if you were looking up here, this is our little tiny two-lane highway. I don't know if any of you on this call actually remember it when it looked like this. I certainly wasn't around for it. Um, but this would be the present day um, location of the Clam Beach overpass. And right up here, this would be the CHP station roughly. Um, so you can actually see the railroad trestle leaving the beach route, what is now the Hammond Trail essentially. Um, and it would go across the two lane highway and go into Cornell. So there were a lot of railroads supporting what became the NWP. Um, this is the Pacific Lumber Company's route over the Scotia Bluffs. They built a railroad from their mill in Scotia all the way to Fields Landing because before they had a railroad to San Francisco, they would take their product to Fields Landing and it would get shipped all over the world. So they actually built this section, Scotia Bluffs, which would become NWP. So there really was a need for large scale transport. Uh, the isolated county needed a way to ship goods and people. Profit would be bolstered by the ability to ship products efficiently. Now, early rail cars were smaller, but if we're talking about modern terms, one typical rail car, let's say like a 1990s box car, is equivalent to roughly three semi truck loads. Um, and I know for a fact that in the 70s, there would be, you know, three to five 100 car trains leaving Eureka, um, you know, every single week. So it's pretty. Uh, Pretty unbelievable. Now, um, NWP was not easy to construct. Um, as this headline shows, this is from the Humboldt Room at HSU, uh, NWP cost $25 per foot to construct. There was a total of 40 tunnels and more than 54 major bridges. Now, at the end of the history of the NWP, there weren't a total of 40 tunnels. Some of them were daylighted. Some of them were basically just uh, blasted for whatever reason, uh, but originally there were 40. So our last tunnel is Lolita, and that's number 40. Um, and this is incredibly dangerous work. Remember, this is 1907 to 1914, so there weren't exactly uh, a lot of safety regulations. So Island Mountain was 4,300 feet long, and I found this quote that just really shocked me uh, in the Humboldt Room. One shot hung fire, which happened sometimes, and didn't go off with the rest. The men all went back in and started working when it went off, and it killed 17 of them. So that's from the Time Standard uh, recollection from Andrew Dinzoli, a really great historian of this area. Uh, that was in 78. Um, and they're referring to the construction between, I would say, probably about 1910 to 1913 at this time. I wanted to quote um, Josh because I think this is just such an amazing, um, another amazing thing about NWP. So the fact that they even built this in the Eel River Canyon is amazing on its own. So I'm just gonna read this to you really quick. Um, another large flaw in the NWP's design was that much of the railroad's right of way in the canyon was constructed below the high water mark, which immediately put the railroad in danger of flooding. Heavy and regular precipitation loosened the sedimentary soils of the canyon and caused landslides and washouts. In 1913, the Eel River flooded and sent raging torrents of water downstream, which ripped the railroad's new right-of-way shelf off the canyon's walls and left the tracks dangling in midair. The floodwaters devastated the yet-to-be-completed NWP. Whether in a state of ignorance or hopeless, hopefulness, the SP and the ATSF believed this route was still feasible and push forward with construction once the floodwaters had receded. So you could say that this thing was pretty much doomed from the start, but if you're cutting old growth redwood, you can afford it. So they push forward. So seven years later after consolidation, the line was completely, sorry, the line was finally completed at Cane Rock, October 23rd, 1914. Hundreds of people traveled by train from Eureka and from, from San Francisco. The county was now linked to the outside world. So a few years back, the Clark Museum actually had the Golden Spike on exhibit. Um, so a lot of us actually got to see it, which was a pretty amazing thing if you're a rail buff uh, like me. 
So this is 106 years ago. Um, when I went down to Island Mountain, I also had the chance to go to Cane Rock. So if you look at this photo, this is kind of a time lapse here. So the top one is 1914 and the bottom is October 2015. I wanted to get down there 100 years later, but I got there 101, so we'll take it. Um, and worth noting that holding the spike is Alice Palmer. She was actually the daughter of the NWP president. Also, the mayors of San Francisco and Eureka were present. So this was a pretty big deal at the time. And this is another bit of a time lapse. Looking back, I wish I just stood a little bit further to the right. I think Josh got a better photo of this than I did. Um, but here you can see, looking eastbound, this would be towards Alder Point. And that bridge is absolutely still standing, and it's uh, still in pretty good shape, frankly. But, of course, it is the NWP. And many employees used to joke that, they, I mean, they would call it never without problems or nowhere in particular. So celebrations in Eureka and Arcata were delayed by a day. Immediately after the ceremony, there was a landslide at McCann, which is north of the event. Um, the train was actually delayed on the way to Cane Rock. And I kind of think this was an eerie forecast for the next 85 years in the canyon. So I found this many years ago in the Humboldt room, and I think it's been in circulation now, and I just think it's so beautiful. I need to get this, you know, absolutely blown up and framed, but it says, we are now wedded to the universe by rails of steel. We welcome you to Humboldt County, California, through the Redwoods. Now, I mean, obviously I think this is cool because I love railroads, but to the average person, they might just think, oh, well, it's just, you know, railroad, like, who cares? It's some steel and some wooden ties. Well, you just have to sort of think about for a second what it was like to get to Humboldt County in 1914. Um, we've had landslides in 2017, 2018. It's hard to get down sometimes, even just because of the highway problems. If you think about what it was like to actually get from San Francisco to Eureka in 1914, it might take you a week to travel by stagecoach, or you would have to go over the Humboldt Bar, which was one of the most notorious, um, most difficult channels to navigate by ship, according to all the shipwrecks that are out there, we know that. Um, so I think it's just really interesting to think that at the time, this was so important to these people that they would say something like this, we are now wedded to the universe. I just think it's really, I don't know, I feel like people don't write like this anymore. So NWP really became a vital artery. Um, there were mills in Cornell, Arcata, I will let you read the rest of them. Um, there were gravel and rock operations in Trinidad, Fortuna, Island Mountain, uh, natural gas in the later years in Fortuna, Arcata. They would definitely deliver fuel for the locomotives. Um, I don't know if they were delivered fuel for like gas stations and things like that, but it's possible. Um, they delivered dairy, uh, from Eureka, Lolita, Fernbridge, there was fish packing in Eureka. And uh, we do have photographs of people getting sent off to World War I and they would actually meet down at the Eureka Depot and uh, travel by train down to San Francisco. So it's probably fair to say that um, some troops probably traveled for World War II also. Definitely fits the time period. So, I think it's just kind of shocking to look at how expansive the NWP once was. Um, all of these black lines in the yellow areas, these are all connecting railroads, but the thick black lines right here, you can see that they had a southern terminus in Sausalito, um, San Rafael. Um, you could actually ride the ferry and go from San Francisco to either of these points. So you have Tiburon or Sausalito down here. Uh, worth noting also, there, is, there isn't a Golden Gate Bridge yet. So at the time, NWP was the gateway to the North Coast because you could take an NWP branded ferry, ride it from San Francisco. In fact, there is still an NWP ferry, the Eureka, down at the Maritime Museum in San Francisco at Fisherman's Wharf. You could ride that ferry, get on the train, and actually ride all the way to Eureka. Um, it was expansive. And also, there was an entire separate line that went out towards uh, Tomales Bay. 
There was the line that went out to Cazaderos. Some of these were narrow gauge. Um, many of them are broad gauge. Some of them got converted to, as such. So there's just all these little fingers. There was also 600 volt inner urban service. So there were electric trains also. We like to think in 2020 that we had come up with this bright idea, oh, we should have mass transit. Well, we had mass transit. We decided to kill it by building bridges and highways that made cars more convenient for us. Uh, things we have lost. I wanna mention also some of the branch lines. Um, this dotted line was the proposed Albion branch. It was never finished. The black line that is actually completed, that's the only section that they finished. They never actually connected the whole thing. Um, you'll see also there was a branch out of Willits called the Sherwood branch. As you're driving through Willits today, there's actually a road called Sherwood. Uh, so you can still see remnants of that. And if any of you have ever driven, or sorry, ridden the skunk train, all of that equipment traveled by NWP because it connected right there in Willits. All right, Ken, Corinne, just doing a check-in. Everything's still looking good. Any more questions? Uh, still looks good. Okay, fantastic. We will keep going. Um, and I wanted to include this map also because I think this is just so eye-opening also. Um, you will notice that as you get past Scotia, there are a few branches that actually ran off of NWP. There's the Carlotta branch. The rails still exist, believe it or not. Um, there was connection out to Falk. There was um, a connection all the way out to Samoa, where Timber Heritage now operates um, our speeders and hopefully an excursion train one day. You can see also uh, north of Manila, there was the Humboldt Northern Railway. And the thing that really is surprising to me always, because there's almost no remnant of it, is the Trinidad branch. Um, it was actually scrapped all the way back in 1930. Um, so right at the beginning of the depression um, and it did run straight through Fieldbrook. If you look on a map through Fieldbrook, it does actually say old railroad grade and that's it. So like most mainline railroads in America, NWP ran passenger service until it became less profitable. Amtrak first pulled out of the station May 1st, 1971. It was established by the Congressional Rail Passenger Service Act. And this end up, ended up signaling the end for all regular revenue uh, NWP service. Um, but the most beloved, I think, was the Bud car, which is um, SP number 10. It was a single unit rail diesel car, and we'll see a picture of that in just a second. So I know Jim is going to love this photo. Um, I'm sure you've probably seen it by now. This is Scotia. Um, three years later, this depot was washed downstream. There's actually photos of it in pieces. Uh, so you can see the slash burner in the background. You can actually see a work train next to the bud car. There's the bud car. It's still silver. It ended up hitting a logging truck later on, and that's when it got its red nose. Uh, but I just love this photo. You can see the people dressed in their 60s attire. This pole right here, this is actually a train ordered pole. So as the... Um, engineer or the uh, brakeman or the uh, you know the crews in the caboose as, as they would roll by they would actually reach out and physically grab train orders which would tell them where they're supposed to pull over in sidings uh, you know what stations they're supposed to stop at etc um, and all of that's gone it was completely washed away uh, this is another shot of a eastbound excursion. I just love this one because somebody, this is probably in the 40s, somebody had to actually lean out with their 1940s camera and take a picture, which just seems like it was really difficult to me. This is a westbound excursion, I believe. It could be revenue. Um, I think that's a, that might be a mail car. Um, but this is um, a westbound train going through Lolita. That station is also gone. It wasn't removed by the flood, but it was torn down eventually. Here's the bud car yet again. So this is post 64. You can see the new bridge and it now has the red nose. So that's after the accident, I believe. And I think this is just a really cool shot. Um, one person that ended up riding the bud car took a picture of this um, this, this is the schedule. It's a big one. So you'd leave Eureka Sunday and Friday, train number three at 9.05 a.m. to San Francisco, and then you'd arrive um, at 7 p.m. 
Um, so it took a while. And you also um, never know if there's gonna be landslides that might uh, slow you down. Here's the bud car cruising through South Eureka. I love the action of this shot. And the cool thing is that this, um, this car has actually been saved. It's uh, going to a new uh, Southern Pacific Museum in Rockland, California. So the bud car will be um, put on static display. So we're really happy about that. I think it's really important just to note also that NWP was so a part of the industry of this um, county. I think now when we think of places like Arcata or we think of places like Trinidad or maybe Blue Lake, we don't really think of them as these industrial centers. Like HSU is now the main thing for Arcata, right? It's a college town. Um, this is Arcata, actually. Um, this right here, this building, you might recognize it. This is the Creamery District. That's Portuguese Hall. And this is the old California Barrel Company. If you were to follow these tracks um, out of the frame, you would head towards Samoa. If you went over here to the right, you would be heading towards Eureka. Um, and there's occasional remnants that I still see in the street or maybe in a field somewhere. There's still rails buried out there, but a lot of the stuff is just completely gone. So NWP served as a background for many logging railroads. Uh, Pacific Lumber Company Railroad, the Arcata, um, and Mad River Railroad, the Northern Railroad Lumber Company, and the Hammond Lumber Company, just to name a few. So that's the AMR. They're uh, building engine house out at Corbell. That's actually our speeder that we run, Timber Heritage Speeder, and we also own the number seven. I personally was painting that locomotive this year. Um, this is the Arcata and Mad River Depot. It's now the um, Blue Lake uh, Depot Museum. Worth noting, in the 1950s, and uh, AMR had so many uh, customers, like 15, um, the seven and a half mile run from Corbell to Arcata would take eight hours to serve them all. So I've actually seen slogans of the AMR where they, they would say things like, we're not long, but we sure are wide. Pretty awesome little railroad. Here's the Pacific Lumber Company. Uh, Jim Garrison knows all about this one. This is down there in Scotia. And that caboose, the PL number five, that has also been saved. Um, that's out at Samoa in the Timber Heritage Collection. This is the engine house of Scotia. Um, it's not a roundhouse, it's straight. And two of those engines still exist. So Pacific Lumber held a lumber and railroad empire. It was one of the largest shippers on NWP and Definitely the decline of Palco is one of the contributing factors to the loss of revenue in the 90s. Uh, this is the Hammond Lumber Company's railroad. This is the trestle that I just showed you. Um, going backwards, that would be towards Cornell. And I believe this is, I know, this is Big George, number, the number 15 that used to sit at Sequoia Park. And uh, this locomotive is doing a passenger excursion, and this would be rolling on its way out to Clam Beach. Here's the uh, Samoa shops. I'm trying to just give you an idea of how expansive this empire actually was, this railroad empire. So as of 1929, the line was sold entirely to Southern Pacific. Uh, steam was replaced by diesel, and business continued to boom. Uh, business fluctuated and grew to coincide with the depression, but also the 1950s consumer boom. Uh, one of the people I talked with at my last presentation actually said that it's worth noting that probably a lot of the redwood that left Humboldt County um, during the 1950s probably went to Europe as part of the Marshall Plan because of the rebuilding effort of Europe post-World War II. So it's just interesting to think that, you know, our redwood ended up all over the globe and it might have traveled over NWP. Um, so I just, I had to include this just so that you understand just how busy this railroad used to be. So uh, this is from Josh Buck's uh, senior thesis paper. Um, so I'll just read this really quick. Uh, so this kid who was in Dos Rios on vacation in 1952 recalled his experience uh, with the right-of-way during the post-war lumber boom. I assumed that a few trains a day would pass with long, frustrating intervals, but I was wrong. 
We hadn't even finished unpacking when a northbound freight clanked into town. Soon that train whistled off, but 10 minutes later, another pulled up to the tank, the water tank, and the ritual was reenacted. The trains came in steady procession. One day, while we were swimming in the river, I noticed two trains pull into town from opposite directions. There seemed to be some confusion as to which one would take the siding. Before the issue could be decided, two more trains had arrived, apparently following sections. That made four trains in town at once. Then another showed up. Finally, after much sawing back and forth, the traffic jam cleared up and Dos Rios went back to its usual summonments. So, just a really interesting look at what it was like in the 1950s on NWP. And this would be the uh, station area that they were talking about. I wanted to include some pictures of some of the um, just day-to-day -day freight that you would see. This is below Fortuna. I absolutely love the image of that ash can headlight on top of that SD locomotive. It was really indicative of the NWP engines. The big ash can was helpful for fog and things like that. Um, also notice the spark arresters because of the uh, terrain that these locomotives would travel. That was a very quintessential NWP look, which is just so cool. That's the Scotia Bluffs. Really, NWP sort of became a redwood artery. That's the Lolita trestle. You can see processed uh, timber rolling. Uh, in this case, it's probably heading southbound. So now that we have a little bit of background, I want to examine the empire, which is no longer. Um, how did one of the most profitable railroads in the United States fall apart? I took this photo. I uh, was actually hired as a historical consultant um, to go down for the Caltrout project where they removed a massive um, amount of fill to allow for increased spawning habitat for coho salmon. I believe it was coho. Um, it was an awesome project. Obviously, I was a little sad to see parts of the railroad removed, but the railroad's not using it, so if we can protect the salmon, I consider that a good thing. Um, it was completely eye-opening how much damage there actually is in places like this. This is Woodman Creek. Um, this is 1961, Lolita. Uh, Brian Kerno took this picture. He's super active online and is so good about sharing awesome photos like this. Really nice guy. Uh, and then there's this. That's the same spot. Probably looks worse now. But if I took a picture right now, it would just be a picture of trees. So you wouldn't really care to see it. Um, this is Tunnel 28 in 1964. That's that same excursion. Let's take a look. It's not the same tunnel, but I want to give you an idea. Uh, this is back in 2013. So this tunnel is just east of the last one. But just to give you an idea, this is the 29 sink. We'll talk about that a little bit later. This is the Burger Hump. Uh, this is a section just near Dos Rios that slides almost continuously. I don't even think the rails are attached anymore. I think by now they're probably all broken up. This is another photo. I think this one is from North Coast Journal. Also North Coast Journal, you can see some gondolas in the river. That is a tunnel that no train will be passing through any time in the future. This is sort of an NWP specialty. They call this Swain Track. Always reminds me of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I took this one in Arcata. This isn't necessarily because of any uh, you know, forces of nature, but the railroad's not in use. So they replaced a culvert and no one's there to work on the tracks. So they sit broken up. I think a lot of people are really interested in the NWP because it is a little bit of a, um, it's almost like a soap opera. Um, it tried so hard, but it just ended up failing in the end. And a lot of people have really good memories about it. Somebody, who's much more talented than I am, actually painted this on the interior of tunnel number 40. Um, absolutely the best graffiti I have ever seen. 
I love this quote from 99. What the NWP has already endured would make for a darn good made-for-television soap opera. The line has suffered a lot of pain, and it hasn't gotten a lot of help from the government people who should be helping it. So, December 1964, the Christmas flood. Um, you could watch movies about this. There's documentaries about this flood, like the, uh, you know, the thousand year flood, uh, movie that was amazing. Um, but I want to talk specifically about the railroad. So warm rains melted the snowpack and the rivers raged. The Eel River experienced a thousand year flood event. So this is, uh, from Josh Buck's collection. This is after the flood. It's worth noting that this rail right here is about 110 pounds per yard and it looks like spaghetti and you can see that the original bridge is completely gone there were witnesses that actually saw it get knocked off of its pillars that's what's left of it so the river essentially acted like a sluice and it came through and ripped out all of the stations, except for one, uh, most of the telecommunication lines, um, a lot of the rail cars, it completely erased about, I want to say 10 or 15, maybe 30 miles of roadbed completely, but at least 100 were destroyed in total. I think the only time NWP looked worse than it does today was probably in 1964, 1965. So this is the South Fork Bridge. If you were heading south on 101 and you look at a spot called Dyerville, Dyerville is no longer a town that exists thanks to the flood, you will notice that there are two sections of bridge. Uh, the original section is this part over here on the right side, and the other section is the new part that was actually built in 1965. So it actually got plugged up with debris and it ended up falling, um, ended up getting knock off, knocked off of its pillars, I think a little bit after the flood waters receded. Here's the Scotia Bluffs. It largely missed uh, the main town of Scotia, but it ramped up along the side of the bluffs and just wrecked complete havoc on the railroad. Um, there's still chunks of the old bridge. This is actually down at Island Mountain. I took this when I was flying through the canyon. So Southern Pacific made the decision to hastily reopen the line. Now I'm not gonna fault them for this because they needed to get this thing back up and running. Uh, Cane Rock, Island Mountain, and South Fork Bridges were almost completely destroyed. Uh, major tunnels in the canyon were plugged with debris and all of the stations in the canyon besides Fort Seward, likely because it's up on a bluff, were gone. So Morrison Nudson, they were tasked with rebuilding the line to the flood ravaged communities in Humboldt. So MK really rushed the rebuild. They did everything in their power to make this happen as fast as possible. So major equipment was actually brought in from projects across the West Coast. Over 800 people worked on rebuilding the line at a cost of over $11 million. The original cost of the line in 1914 dollars was 14 million. So Kind of amazing how quickly they did it and kind of makes sense that it cost so much. So these photos are from C.E. Neal. Um, I think Josh got these from the Roots of Motor Power collection. Uh, this is milepost 211. This is incredible because you can see the roadbed in the background. There's no roadbed left here. It's actually down to the base rock. There's just nothing left. So they had to completely rebuild all of this. This is the new Island Mountain Bridge being built. Um, it's probably why it's still in such good shape. It was only built in 1965. Here's the Cane Rock Bridge. The interesting thing about this is that the majority of the bridge survived, but I believe some of it actually got lifted up. So it had to get pushed back into place and then they had to rebuild some of the approaches. It was basically left like an island. Um, this one just absolutely blows my mind. So this is the South Fork Bridge. So there's debris all through the trusses, as it says. And if you look at that caption in the right corner, the redwood tree hanging from this bridge was 967 years old. So that tells you how infrequently this type of event actually happens. 
All right, Corinne, we still doing good? Uh, there was a question in the chat regarding the constructions of the tunnels. Um, okay. I was just wondering who um, were the people that did the construction, particularly if there were specific ethnic groups like the Chinese immigrants or um, you know who, who kind of took on that dangerous job? Yeah, so I'm almost positive and and this is one of the things that's really frustrating because I've I've studied a lot about Donner Summit, which is the original transcontinental. There's much better records about who actually did the work, but we know that there were Chinese uh, workers, there were Italian workers, I believe there were probably uh, Portuguese workers, um, probably, well we know that there were workers from uh, Nova Scotia also, but um, there were all sorts of different people that worked on the line, but that's not something that you see a lot of records for. Um, and I think I could probably spend even more time just researching that specific topic, but it's worth noting that this was basically a branch line of one railroad of thousands in the US. So yeah, there's just not really a whole lot of records for that. And hopefully one day we'll find more out about that. Okay, uh, thank you. So, it's worth noting that they ended up rebuilding 100 miles of railroad in 177 days. So Humboldt County was desperate for transportation in a time when goods were being flown in because of the lack of highways. Uh, one of our old uh, THA members actually told me that he remembers grocery store employees taking their own vehicles to the airport to pick up supplies that had been delivered for the stores. We lost 101 North, South, 299, 36, and the railroad. So we needed this thing. Uh, but the problem is the railroad, the rebuild didn't address the 1914 technology used to adhere the railroad to the canyon. Uh, they didn't build it any higher. You can't just build a railroad higher when you've got 40 tunnels to deal with. Um, well, there's not 40, there's about 30 through the canyon. So despite the rebuilt trackage, landslides and washouts continued to plague the line. So this is a little bit later on. Um, this is the Scotia Bluffs. You can see some of the murkiness of the water. Of course, those are ties sitting over there on the left side. Um, and really you can just see how gooey the, uh, the mud was. And this isn't even the worst mud on the canyon. Uh, this sandstone stuff is bad. Um, there's fossils that come out of it because this is a 2 million year old seafloor deposit. Um, so the Scotia Bluffs were difficult but they were able to generally keep them at bay. So SP was able to keep trains running from 64 to 78 without any major incidents. There were train wrecks, there were derailments, that kind of stuff, but no major weather issues. Uh, business stayed stable so long as landslides and washouts were kept at bay. Um, and it's worth noting at the Scotia Bluffs, they had approximately 20 people who were just employed full time just maintaining that section, and it's two and a half miles of track. So, to some of the other facilities in the area, this is the Willits Roundhouse. Um, you can see some of the SD locomotives. I absolutely love this photo. This is from John West. This is a uh, shot of the Bud Car going through the beautiful Eel River Canyon. I will always lament the fact that I will never get to ride this railroad. Um, and it was never ending work. Uh, when cleanup and repairs were done daily, work was at an ad needed basis. When landslides and culverts continued to get worse, the dollar cost got even higher and higher. Preventive maintenance was key. So, we reached it. September 6, 1978. In my eyes, the line would never be the same. Crews working at Island Mountain noticed heavy smoke pouring from the southwest portal of Island Mountain, the 4,314 foot tunnel, number 27. Dry redwood timbers had caught a spark and were burning out of control. Now, I don't, we'll never know exactly how this happened. My guess is that because Island Mountain, when you go into the tunnel, it's actually an uphill, um, there's a chance that a northbound um, freight accelerating out of the Island Mountain Yard could have launched sparks up into the tunnel. And I do remember reading that there was a southbound freight that was drifting down grade. And as it came out of the tunnel, 
that's right around the time that the crews initially saw the fire starting. So there's a chance that the uh, diesel exhaust simply fanned the flames and, I mean, just the wind of a train rolling through a tunnel like that. So they ended up calling fire cars in from as far away as Roseville. So these are special firefighting cars, uh, rail cars. But it continued. So there were actually fire breaks that were engineered in the tunnel. So it'd be like a section of shotcrete, which is like this pneumatically sprayed concrete. So they'd have the shotcrete sections um, and then wood timbers and then another set of shotcrete section. Um, it didn't work. Uh, the timbers behind the concrete lining actually caught fire as well. So when they went in to spray the tunnel, in some cases they weren't even able to spray the burning wood. It was actually behind the concrete. So this made it completely impossible to even wet the fire. And because it's 4,300 feet long and about 20 feet tall, that's an enormous amount of space. And it just made it impossible to enter the tunnel because it was poisonous, it was hot, um, way too dangerous to send people into. They actually sent cars in, like flat cars, with hoses on the end and tried to spray the tunnel and it still didn't work. So this is why I'm showing this yet again. Hopefully everybody can see that little tube right there on top of the portal. That's a fire door. So the fire door is an engineered um, piece of equipment that would actually close down so that they could effectively cut off oxygen from um, you know, allowing a fire to grow out of control. They were gone in 1978. They actually removed them. I believe it was the summer before this actually happened which was the absolute worst time to do that. And further evidence that there were fire doors, there was a North Portal in about 1961, and they removed it. So they ended up trying to use foam, water, and suffocation, and it failed. The fire had created its own draft, kind of like a steam locomotive, making a fire so hot that it cracked rock 300 feet above the tunnel roof. The only solution was to block the ends and let it burn. It continued to do so for two weeks. So I found this well after I actually completed my initial article for the Humble Historian. You can actually see where they've closed off the portal and you can see burn marks on the top. Uh, the burn marks aren't, aren't there today, but I imagine they were cleaned off at some point. Um, you, so you can actually see some of the damage from the fire. And notice just how small the, the workers are. So here's a shot from the company that actually was tasked to do the rebuild. So the same firm which performed the 1964 flood damage repair was charged with rebuilding the tunnel. 1,600 feet of it had collapsed. Many believed it would be rebuilt in a matter of months. So, but the problem was, is crews had to wait for the rock to cool before inspection was even possible. So after the two week period where the fire finally went out, they had to wait even longer for the thing to cool down because you basically just have a giant portal of heat at that point. So these are photos from uh, MK. This is some of their, um, their press releases. So here they are actually looking at some of the timbers which had been damaged. Um, this is part of the process of actually rebuilding the tunnel. So they would move forward, dig, and then dig, 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 and then keep moving forward. And they would basically continue to do that. And while they were actually digging it out, they would build these steel beams across the top. One of the problems with rebuilding this tunnel is that as you dig, it's this serpentine type of like sandy soil and it would collapse as you were digging into it. It's like digging into the beach. Um, it's incredibly difficult to keep it solid. So here's photos of them. Just an idea of the scale. You can see these people standing next to this bulldozer. It's a very, very big piece of infrastructure. So progress was a lot slower than expected. Uh, Don Clausen, our congressman at the time, um, explored all of these avenues to prevent complete closure of the railroad. I really love this quote at the end here. Uh, Lynch said that some of the com 
that the company had experienced some labor problems and the two crews working at both ends of the collapse tunnel, working 10 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, Lynn said that three weeks ago, an entire crew was fired after they walked off the job one Friday to party in Garberville. So definitely having some issues. So Don Clausen visits, everybody feels good about it. And then literally a week later, SP publishes a map in the Time Standard, and it just casually shows this map that says, soon to be abandoned, Willits to Eureka section. Uh, they thought that the costs had become too high, and the easiest way to cut the losses would be to abandon the tunnel rebuild and the railroad. They could still run to Willits, but at this point, they were tired of all the maintenance issues, and they thought, okay, this is the thing. We're, we're done with it. We're not going to fix it. So there's a lot of this kind of stuff in the Time Standard and other newspapers where it's just basically saying that, uh, you know, the railroad officials were remaining very coy on their intentions. They would say one thing to the public and then publish something else. So it's like it wasn't really clear what was going to happen. And if you're a business owner on the North End and you rely on, um, you know, railroad uh, shipments, then you were definitely stressing about this. This is from Don Clausen. To this end, I want to make it very clear that in representing the people of Humboldt and Mendocino, as well as everyone on the North Coast, I will oppose any effort to abandon rail service to our area. I will convey this opposition in the most forceful terms to the ICC. I feel certain that the longstanding and mutually profitable relationship between Northwestern Pacific and our area is one that you will want to continue. So, the story gets even crazier. When the tunnel collapsed, there were eight SD9 locomotives, which was the hallmark locomotive for SP and NWP at this time, and over 400 rail cars were trapped north of the tunnel. Most of them were sitting in Eureka, just idle. Well, rail cars and locomotives, they have to be doing stuff to make money. So when they were just sitting there, uh, they were losing about $400 a month due to the idle rail cars and about $200,000 a month due to the locomotives trapped in Eureka. So they actually made the decision to truck some of these SD9s through around the canyon. Yeah, they went around the canyon and actually went over Bell Springs Road, which if you've been on Bell Springs Road, you know that's not a place to take a big locomotive like this. That thing weighs 160 tons. With the wheel sets, it's probably, wheel sets removed and fuel tanks off, it's probably still 120. It's a lot. So with permission from the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors, SP began the move of the eight SD9s. Only four were actually moved due to the enormous cost and labor. And there's footage that they almost rolled one over on Bell Springs Road. If that had happened, it would probably still be there. Uh, the total cost of the move amounted to almost $1 million, and after the fact, Southern Pacific concluded that it just wasn't worth it. I read a, a thing from a guy on trainorders.com. He was actually someone that worked at the Roseville Yards. He said that one of these engines showed up at Roseville after this move, and they didn't even end up using it. A waste. So trucking became a competitor at this point the lumber industry starts to feel a pinch. So faced with an uncertain future, NWP starts losing customers. The North Coast Lumber Companies needed to explore other options. And besides just the tunnel itself, I mean, that was a problem. I think really it was the absence of the railroad for 15 whole months. I think that's what really did it. So SP at this point says, okay, tunnel repairs are too expensive. Uh, we're going to end it here. Um, and there's so many different articles that look like this, um, where they basically say that they're just not gonna do it. They're not gonna finish it. But the communities of Arcata, Eureka, Samoa, Fortuna, Scotia, Lolita, Willits, and Cloverdale, to name a few, all oppose the exit of Southern Pacific. This included Palco, Louisiana Pacific, Simpson Timber, Arcata Redwood, and more. They were all in trouble because of the lack of railroad. So despite all of this confusion, um, it, and after taking longer than a year, Island Mountain was finally reopened. It cost them $19 million. 
which is $5 million more in 1914 dollars than the original cost of the railroad, which is just such an incredible statistic to me because if you haven't realized, that tunnel is just sitting there now. It's a $19 million hole in the ground. So here's a little bit of railroad graffiti. I know uh, Josh has taken a picture of this also, but I think this is from Derek Sparadalazzi, who I got some of these photos from originally. Um, this is still inside the tunnel. So they actually painted this. It's the first train after fire. But despite the reopening of the tunnel, the year absence of service caused many customers to shift to trucking. In 1982, the NWP moved just 16,000 carloads over its trackage, a mere fraction of the 65% it moved in 75, a drop of about 75%. So you can really look at it as like the time period before Island Mountain and the time period after. There was no going back. If you have to constantly do maintenance to keep this thing going, you need as many carloads as possible to make it uh, profitable. And it wasn't. It was no longer profitable. So, in order to cope with this, July 18th of 1983, SPM stated a $1,200 surcharge for every single rail car headed south from Eureka or north from Willits. And this was basically their attempt at coping with the high costs of the deteriorating canyon. However, the move now made the railroad more expensive than trucking, which doomed the business on the north end, which is exactly what SP wanted. So you actually start seeing uh, shippers like the lumber companies and other businesses that were relying on the railroad basically saying things like this. Uh, they were complaining that NWP was actually making it hard to get service. And the railroad was going, oh, well, they don't want to use our railroad. I guess we'll have to abandon it. We don't want to fix it anymore. So it was kind of this weird thing that they did where they were getting exactly what they wanted just by making service worse than it should be. So there ended up being a lot of resentment for SP. Uh, railroaders tend to be sort of, uh, how do I say this? It seems like a lot of people had a lot of uh, love for this railroad. And I think a lot of them were very sad to see what had happened to it. I really like this quote. One former railroad man wept as he described the NWP's decline. The cutback in maintenance led to weakened tracks, unsafe rail cars, fire prone tunnels, and a collapsing rail bed, according to workers and inspectors. That line's going to hell. But wait, there's more. There was another tunnel fire. Southern Pacific filed for abandonment a second time in 1983. It was denied. September 11th of that same year, a second tunnel fire broke out near Longvale, 12 miles north of Willits, and this is tunnel number 12. SP saw it as a final death knell for the Willits to Eureka block. SP refused to rebuild the tunnel because the price tag was well over $600,000. It was much smaller than 27. But this is money they were not willing to spend on an already financially broken subsidiary. Remember, this is not their mainline track. This is basically just a short 300 mile run up to Eureka, which is nothing compared to the route, you know, all the way down to Texas or all the way out to Utah or to Oregon. So the Interstate Commerce Commission held new abandonment meetings with the president of Southern Pacific. He stated it was costing an average of a million dollars each month to maintain the line between Willits and Eureka. The company's losses totaled approximately $70 million. So, mud glaciers, sinks, slides, and other issues. Uh, Fred Stint's excellent 1985 publication, that's this one, uh, lists 85 different major problem areas between Dos Rios and Scotia as of 1982. Now, some of that is just abbreviated. It just says there's a lot of these sinks between this time period. So I did my best to sort of add it up. But here's an example. Uh, Milepost 201, 
The MP201 slide east of Kekawaka is a major slide 900 feet long and three quarters of a mile long with a slide mass of some 18 million cubic yards. The track is now humped 20 to 25 feet. So let's look at 201. So that little yellow line right there, that's supposed to be the property line. This is a, you know, probably 2017 or 2018 view of the 201 slide from Google Earth. Um, this ended up being one of the most difficult spots to keep open. Uh, Dan Hauser, I think, is still on this call. Uh, this is one of his photos that I absolutely love. This is some of the grading work that they were doing in the 90s. This type of stuff was absolutely constant. And that's what it looks like rolling. That would be northbound, I believe. Just absolutely unbelievable how much this land would move. But SP wasn't allowed to actually pull out yet. The Interstate Commerce Commission, with the help of a federal judge, determined that by not rebuilding the tunnel, SP had illegally abandoned the railroad north of Willis. This means that SP was actually forced yet again to keep the line open, but they were only doing so because they were required to. So they ended up rebuilding tunnel number 12, but they continued to neglect the track and total infrastructure. And from what I've read, basically there was only a few trains that went up and down the canyon and they would clean out culverts, you know, cut brush, make sure that slides weren't happening, but they only did that enough to find a buyer. Enter Brian Whipple. August 27th, 1984, he successfully purchases the north end of the line from Outlet Creek to Eureka. He actually used to be an SP executive and he was a big time rail buff. And I think he was living in Iowa at the time. And then it, he ended up purchasing the line for some crazy low amount of like $5 million, but it was some really strange deal that they put together to actually purchase it. But despite a strong spirit and renewed effort to maintain the canyon, there just wasn't enough capital to do the repairs needed for stable operations. If a giant company like SP, which literally used to be like the octopus, couldn't do it, Eureka Southern couldn't either. So I don't know how many of you actually got a chance to ride this. Maybe you've tuned into my presentation because you're wondering what happened to this line that you got to ride. Lucky for you, I, I wish I could have been on these excursions, but this is one of the North Coast Daylight trains. Uh, I particularly love this one because you can see that dome car up front. So a lot of these were like old Great Northern cars and they were painted to look like Southern Pacific Daylight cars. Nonetheless, absolutely beautiful. Problem is, is that this was sort of a bad new deal. The Eureka Southern got stuck, stuck operating the worst section of the line, which was the Eel River Canyon. There were zero customers in the stretch from Scotia south to Outlet Creek and Willits. And this meant that SP was still collecting freight from Eureka, but now they were doing it without having to spend any money, money in the canyon. So it was great for SP, terrible for Eureka Southern. So maybe you remember some of these locomotives running around town. Um, one of my favorite heralds, I love that. They actually correct, correctly show the Southwark Bridge, which is really cool. And there was a lot of optimism. You know, people were really thrilled to ride these uh, North, Coast, North Coast Daylight excursions, excuse me. Um, they ran from Willits to Eureka. Sometimes they were going so slow that everybody would cram into one car so that they could get into the one rail car that actually had air conditioning because the track speeds were so low that the batteries couldn't be charged fast enough. Um, so yeah, just a really interesting time period. Um, this is milepost 196. This would be just east of Island Mountain. You can see some of the recent grading being done. You can barely tell the difference between the ballast, which is like the rock, and just the landslide. And this is from my buddy James Rodas and his dad. So Eureka Southern did have a few, um, I would say a few good years, but that might even be a stretch. They had a good effort, and they moved a lot of freight but it just didn't last. This is probably one of the longest trains Eureka Southern ever saw. Um, they continued to do the excursions. Uh, excursions are, probably weren't nearly as profitable as the freight at this time, 
but it was really good PR and people loved it because it was just a very scenic route and passenger service ended in 1971. So this is a chance for people to see the Canyon again. But after just 18 months, Eureka Southern, Eureka, that E-U-K-A is the reporting mark, by the way, was in a financial hole. A man named Jerry Gregg was appointed as the trustee, and he proceeded to allow the illegal scrapping and removal of over 28 miles of spurs and sidings. Uh, the property and logging rights were sold off as well. And Dan explained it to me later on that this really you know, hurt the function of the railroad because basically it became like a highway with no exits. Um, it was difficult to get rail cars to businesses. It was difficult to logistically allow trains to pass each other because a lot of the spurs were cut down and made shorter. Um, just really hurt the overall operation of the railroad. And so Eureka Southern had to end also. This, this is when the uh, Eureka units were actually stored down in Eureka, or sorry, Willits. You can see them parked next to some of the SP Cadillacs. SD9s, and I love these these photos. You can see just how tired these engines were. There's oil all over the long hoods. Apparently they had plenty of engine issues. They came from uh, Conrail, and I think some of them were rebuilt and they actually are still in, function, in, uh, in service. So, in 1991 and then eventually 1992, the North Coast Railroad Authority was passed into law, and the whole purpose of this was to keep the important railroad alive. However, the funding was actually vetoed by Governor George Duke Majin. The railroad now operated under the name of North Coast Railroad, but it would barely see six years of operations. And the crazy thing about this is that it's kind of I, I want to say this is common in California, but it was and still is an unfunded mandate. They're tasked with maintaining the right of way, running the railroad, and they don't have any funding. So here's some shots from the very, very end. These are empties likely heading north to Eureka. There wasn't a whole lot of southbound, or there wasn't a whole lot of northbound freight. They were pretty much taking empties up to Eureka to be filled by the mills. That's the Eureka Slough Bridge. This sequence of photos, that engine ended up with that train out at uh, Corbell. It was a, a train um, servicing the mill out there. So I love this quote. It runs tired out locomotives on badly worn track. It is $5.5 million in debt and losing thousands of dollars a month. Yet it's black and red locomotives continue to snake through spectacular wilderness hauling loads of timber, plywood, and wood pulp from sawmills in Blue Lake and Scotia, fresh milk from dairies and creameries near Fortuna, frozen seafood from Eureka, fish processors, grain from Petaluna, and its train crews still ogle river otters and golden eagles along the way. And that was September of 97. Uh, by the way, I was six. <laughs> Here's the 3190, it's my favorite diesel on the North Coast. That engine at one point actually hauled a passenger special to Monterey with um, Eisenhower, believe it or not. And now she's rot rotting in the yard. That's the Fort Seward Depot. So long as the fires don't go any further north, that is still standing. It's the last depot in the canyon. Now, right at the very, very end, there was a name change, and it was called the new NWP. Uh, this is like 97 to 98. So that's one of the SD9 uh, locomotives that they had. Um, apparently, they were very troublesome. They came from a company called Omnitrax that did rebuilds in uh, Loveland, Colorado, and they didn't last very long on the property. So finally, um, in 1997, the El Nino storm event of 97 caused major track damage near Shellville, which blocked all outgoing traffic from NWP. Now I had read about this a lot and it wasn't until I talked to Dan about this, Dan Hauser about this, and this whole idea of like what actually happened at the end. What I didn't realize is it wasn't just the damage in the canyon, it was actually 
washouts and issues in Shellville, making it so that all of this traffic that could have been leaving on the north end couldn't leave the railroad where it connected to the rest of the network down at Shellville. And that's in Napa County. So with no money to fund maintenance because they weren't making any money taking the trains nowhere, uh, the canyon was actually kept alive by workers, in some cases, on a volunteer basis. Now, some of the awarded FEMA money was misused, being allocated for fuel and other operational costs. And this is according to what I have read. Um, there's always people that say other things about the story. Um, I'm always trying to better understand the situation, but eventually the FEMA money was cut off. By April of 98, it had been turned into a roller coaster. This is another uh, Dan Hauser photo. This is some of the flooding down at Shellville. Here's some of the attempts to fix some of these sinks. I think this is near Kekawaka. Here's the Scotia Bluffs laying down some new track panels. This type of image was very, very common on this railroad. And nowadays, a lot of the line has uh, landslides like this. I believe this is the 29 sink. So the very, very last train to Island Mountain. It was a rainy Tuesday in February 1998 when train engineer Nick Mitchell, no relation, and conductor Gary Kittleson chugged out of the South Fork station in a miserable storm. Hauling more than $500,000 worth of high-grade redwood, they were headed for a rendezvous with a northbound train at the Island Mountain Station, an unpopulated outpost amid a stretch of track so secluded that it winds about 70 miles without a road crossing. Just before 5 p.m., as horizontal rain beat against the windshields of the two locomotives pushing the load, the men heard the first distress call from the train master Ferguson. He radioed Mitchell that the foul weather had turned their sister train back south. Worse, a critical situation loomed straight ahead. Just a quarter mile down the line, the incessant rains had created a condition local conductors know as swinging track, with the rails washed out from beneath them. The rails dangled in midair like a wind-blown suspension bridge. I told them to get those locomotives out of there, to drop their load, and come on home, said Ferguson. Even after ditching their heavy load, the men escaped with little time to spare. A few hours later, the rains washed out more than 300 feet of track just north of them, stranding the cargo on an island less than a mile long. And there it is. So you can actually see that now the tracks are actually washing out from the interior or underneath the train, um, but it's still there. It's an 11 car train and if you're interested in looking at it, it's actually still visible from Google Earth. Um, the, the Redwood Lumber um, was still there until about 19, no, sorry, 2001. So if you're looking for lumber, it's, you're out of luck, but um, it was removed. Uh, but the train still sits there, and I don't know that it's ever going to leave, barring, you know, a scrapper's torch and a lot of effort. So after the canyon fell apart, after this train got stuck there, there was an effort to actually rebuild the line, and it is shockingly, uh, it, it, it's shocking to me just how close it actually was. Uh, so this was a gap that would never be bridged. So this is one of the sections that was very badly washed out. Um, ended up kind of looking like this. You can see some dozer tracks where they were grading and such. So there was a um, final work train that actually headed through this section. And this is actually from someone that I talked to on our North Coast Railroad History site, this guy named Aaron Francis. He said the final moves from the north were made by Clyde Ferguson and Gary Kittleson, I believe. They went out to 197.40, that's a mile post, to retrieve a cat, caterpillar, and flat car with the 3857. That's one of their locomotives. When we delivered it there, we were about seven rail miles from the work train up from Willits and could talk to them on the radio. They were so close to getting it back together, but there just wasn't any money. 
So here they are actually working on the 29 sink. You can actually see the visible slope in these rails as they're trying to stretch them and get this thing back together. And that's that same section that I showed earlier. It's completely, uh, completely washed out now. There was a guy, uh, Wayne Parsons. I found his photos a while back on a website and he actually um, was able to send them to me. He had actually run the last speeder trip through the canyon. Um, and this was in about May of 1998. And this is that same section. So this is the 29 sink. So flash forward 22 years later. It's almost hard to believe that it's been that long. But when you look at the infrastructure that exists, it looks like it's been much longer, maybe like 50 years. So this is from Josh Buck. Uh, these are some of the photos that you can see. They're on our North Coast Railroad History site. Um, I'll have a link up at the end. Um, this is near Tunnel 37 up here on the north end. This is Bell Springs. You can see the culverts are completely blown out. Uh, the roadbed is basically non-existent and the tracks are just hanging like ribbons on the earth. But some of the biggest infrastructure still exists. All the tunnel portals are still there. Uh, this is Woodman Creek. I just think that this is one of the most scenic tunnel portal portals probably on the west coast. Uh, this is what it looks like on the other side. It was actually such an unstable part that it actually had a rock shed. On Donner Summit, they have snow sheds. For the NWP, they had rock sheds because apparently on NWP, rocks fall like snow, like they do in Tahoe. Um, this is looking westbound out of the portal of that last tunnel, Woodman. Um, this rock is about the size of a, maybe a small school bus. It is absolutely massive. Um, Josh caught this photo, which is better than anything I have, and you can actually see, it's so sad, it actually still says 1950 on the portal, and the concrete uh, has completely been taken out by these landslides, so the rock shed has actually failed. And this is about 20, I think this is 2019, I think it's, yeah, maybe 2020. Some of the other remnants that people don't realize, uh, this is downtown Blue Lake. There's that same engine from some of the other photos. That's 3779 heading towards the mill. Um, you almost can't even tell that there was a railroad there. And this is on the old Arcata and Mad River. This dress was still standing. There's just nothing on it. That's Glendale near Blue Lake. Took this photo back in 2015, I believe. Um, that engine on the end, the CCT number 70, that one has been scrapped. Um, I was lucky enough that the guy who owned it or was actually cutting it up, he gave me the number boards from it. Um, and it was a pretty cool engine that you know ran on NWP. It was the last locomotive to make a movement on the north end. If you've seen this inside track car, which is sitting on the safety corridor near the old mill across from Harper Motors, um, this is the last official rail movement on the North End, and this happened in 2001. They pushed that car from Old Town Eureka up to the siding at the mill, parked it. They took the number 70 back down to the balloon track, shut her prime mover down, and she never ran again. And they scrapped her back in 2015, I believe, 2016. I was lucky enough to actually stand in the cab of it before they finally cut it up completely. So let's just talk a little bit about the future. Uh, the NCRA fought for 15 years to open the line. I'm saying fought now. I used to say NCRA was fighting to open the line. It's done. Um, as of 2020, the new plan is to scrap all of the track from Eureka to Willits in order to build the Great Road Trail. Uh, this is it's going to be an awesome thing if it happens. My only apprehension is that I think the geology is going to be very, very difficult to cope with. Uh, seeing the photos that you have seen, I think that if a mainline railroad can't do it, 
I'm wondering what the trail is going to do. But I'm remaining optimistic because I would love to go back to Island Mountain or any of those other spots south of there. So in 2011, the South End was reopened. So they are running trains on the old NWP and the new company is called the Northwestern Pacific Company. And they're running from Napa Junction up to Windsor. And they are actually doing repairs up to Cloverdale. It's going slowly, but eventually uh, there might even be freight that far north. Um, and there's been talk for a really long time about reopening things to Willets, but I would never count on ever seeing anything run from Willets to Eureka again. So they completely scrapped and removed all of the old rails through the Bay Area trackage. This is like in the uh, south end near uh, Petaluma, and they replaced it with brand new continuously welded rail. Um, and this is what some of the stations look like, and this is the actual smart. These are the, uh, the DMUs, the diesel motor units, I believe it's called. Um, so they're really cool because they fit inside a city block. So they're not going to block traffic or anything like that. And apparently they've been very successful. In their first full year, they um, pulled about a million passengers. So it's going to be a really cool thing to see them extend it all the way up to Cloverdale one day. And you can see those nice concrete ties with a uh, welded steel track. It's almost hard to believe that these exact rails at one point connected all the way to Eureka. This is the NWP company. They are running freight on the south end again. Uh, Josh um, and our buddy Jelani, we got to go down and actually meet the crew of NWP and they were kind of shocked that people cared about their railroad. <laughs> and um, we were like, oh guys, you have our dream job. This is the coolest thing ever. Um, so they run freight. Um, they serve a few grain um a few grain companies in the uh, North Bay, and they're definitely trying to expand their service. It's it's an awesome little railroad. Nothing like it used to be, but they are actually running on historic NWP tracks. So for the North End, um, if you haven't noticed, I've got my Timber Heritage shirt on. Um, Timber Heritage Association, this is the group that I work for. Uh, one day we hope to open what we're going to call the Humboldt Bay Scenic Railroad. Uh, so these are the speeders. I think Josh might have taken both of these photos. Um, so this is out of Samoa, and then you can also see it um, over at the Eureka Slough Bridge. And we operate this at historic equipment during the summers, not this summer, obviously. And we're hoping that one day we can actually have an excursion train around the bay. And we've been working with the cities of Eureka, Humboldt County, to actually um, build this, hopefully build the trail next to the tracks so that we can have both an excursion and uh, the trail, because we would love to have both. Uh, we've been working really hard. This is the Arcadian Mad River number 101. This is an engine that used to run on the AMR between Eureka and Corbell, um, or I should say Corblex and Corbell. So this is the engine that we hope to actually use in excursion service one day, and it is fully operational, brand new coat of paint. And that's my buddy Wes sitting in the cab. This is a project that I've been working on with Josh. Um, this is our Suburban that we actually picked up recently. We think it did run on NWP back in the day. It's a 1984 and we're hoping to give private rail tours coupled with uh, you know tours of the Samoa shops. So this is definitely something we want to do in the future. We've moved three heavyweight cars and four commute coaches up to Samoa and we hope to actually use these in excursion service one day. This is the interior of the diner car. It's absolutely gorgeous. And all of these cars actually used to, the heavyweight cars actually used to run on NWP. And this is right here in Samoa. We have been working for over 10 years now um, to get this property up to, you know, salvageable shape. And now the shops are looking very good. There's our assortment of locomotives. It's the 29, the seven, the 15, the Murphy diesel, the speeder and the 33. And this is what it looks like now. So we're making really good progress. And the great thing is that uh, this year, I believe we're gonna be completely done with escrow and we're gonna own this property. So the next step is to actually start possibly laying track and um, making it so that we can do some training out there, out at the shops with our locomotive. This is um, the north end of the Lolita Tunnel. 
we've been really lucky to operate on some of the rails that still exist. We did actually take our high rail truck all the way through the tunnel. We can't do that anymore because there's a big washout, but we do operate our speeders in Lolita occasionally. That's what it used to look like before we cleaned or before the washout happened. Um, a few years back, we actually got the trestle in Lolita certified for use. Our speeders are very lightweight and the trestle is actually in very, very good shape. So we do run the speeder across the trestle occasionally. And if you are interested in that, definitely check out our website for next year. This is our number 29, the Palco locomotive. We've completely restored it cosmetically and one day we'd love to see it running, but you know, it's all, it's all money. And this is my personal project, the Arcadia and Mad River number seven. She still exists, and I'm hoping to do a full cosmetic restoration and maybe operational restoration in the future. There's a speeder yet again. And I just wanna do a quick plug. If you are interested in uh, seeing more of these images, I definitely recommend that you check out our Facebook page. Um, this is the page that I run with uh, James Rodas and Josh Buck. Josh Buck has been doing so much work documenting what is left of the railroad. Um, so our Facebook page is uh, facebook.com slash NCRR history. I can definitely um, send out that link later. And if you want to get involved, if you're actually interested in this kind of stuff, uh, TimberHeritageAssociation.org, we are welcoming volunteers of all ages and abilities. We need more people. I think that's one of the biggest problems we have is we just need more people to come out and help. Um, unlike a lot of railroad groups, everyone is encouraged to learn how to operate steam, operate speeders, and help with track duties. Um, and I guess the final thing I should say is that for the Humboldt Bay Scenic Railroad, uh, THA needs permission to work on the rails, and we really need community support to make the excursion train a reality. Uh, the Great Railroad Trail is planned to be built around the bay, but um, we've been working directly with Mike McGuire's office um, to make sure that you know we get a fair shot to actually run the excursion only from Samoa to Eureka. We're not interested in running anything into the canyon because we know better than anyone that you're not going to run trains through the canyon again. Uh, so we just really hope that it can become a reality one day. And so if you're interested in sharing support, you know, Senator McGuire's office or the uh, cities of Eureka, Arcata, the Humboldt County Supervisors, um, I think it's a really, really good project and I just hope that it can happen someday. So, um, I want to just put this up. Thank you to everyone who's made this possible, including ATHS. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody else, for making this happen. Josh, of course, and James. Uh, Dan Hauser, your pictures and info have been completely invaluable to me. So, thank you. Um, and I think that's it. Boom, we did it. We've got a little bit of time for questions. So if anybody has a question, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. It may take me a little while to get to you because I have to scroll through all the tiny screens of people. But does anybody have any questions? Thank you. <clears throat> that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate very, it. Very detailed. I did have a question earlier on about um, <clears throat> when that picture was from the tunnel and when they shut it down. Um, but that's way back, like in the first half hour. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. How, how much support are you getting from the cities of Arcadia and Eureka and so forth to uh, connect the rail alongside the trail, to keep the rail alongside the trail? And, and, what, and who's contributing to make that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the city of Eureka has been actually really awesome. We've also gotten support from the Lodging Alliance um, because they want to see this thing happen. Um, there has been a bit of a renaissance in... Um, you know, interest in railroads in general. I think a lot of that has to do with like the big boy project, which happened. Um, Union Pacific actually rebuilt the largest steam locomotive ever built and they're running it now. So there's a lot of people that want to see it happen. Um, 
the city of Arcata was resistant at first to do the whole thing with the rails or the trail next to the railroad. But um, I think moving forward, a lot of it has to do with Humboldt County and there's an issue with the, uh, the Eureka Slough Bridge. Um, I was actually just posting about it on the Timber Heritage Facebook page that we're trying to look out or work out a solution so that we can actually have the trail on top of the railroad, but still use it for rail use. So have like wooden planks, or concrete with rubber flange fillers. And if you look all over the Bay Trail that's already been built, there's railroad crossing signs. The trail is built next to the railroad. So we're just hoping that that type of thing can continue to happen. And there's definitely more of a cost. It's gonna cost more money, there's no doubt. But I think that if we have something like an excursion train, like what uh, Willits and um, Willits and Fort Bragg has with the skunk train, uh, if you look at the Niles Canyon Railroad down in Sanol, I talked to the president of that railroad a few years back, and he said they had a million dollars in ticket sales for the one year. Um, there's a lot of people that want this to happen. So I'm just hoping that we can come up, come up with some situation that everyone everyone's happy with. I don't want trail people to think that railroad people don't also want, want a trail. I have a bike. I want to ride my bike next to the railroad, that kind of stuff. So we're just hoping to come up with a solution that works for everybody. Is there any likelihood of doing a connection between Blue Lake and Arcata? There's still track there, various spots. I don't know what's left. No, the rails were actually pulled almost completely from Blue Lake to Arcata. Um, that was in 1997 because the railroad owed ANK railroad materials a lot of money, and they ended up uh, scrapping the what was the first railroad in California. They scrapped it to settle debt, um, and they had to do it, unfortunately. But, yeah, those rails are gone, and a lot of times when a railroad ceases to exist, the easement actually disappears also. Um, and most of those trestles are just absolutely falling apart. So that's probably never going to happen again. Okay. Thank you yeah. ever so much. That was great. Of course. Thank you. Uh, Sean, in the chat, someone wanted you to explain what the Bud Car was. Oh, yeah. So the Bud Car, um, Bud was a manufacturer, I believe, of a certain type of rail car. Um, but typically they called it the RDC, the rail uh, diesel car. And it was a single unit car that was actually used as the passenger train. So instead of having, uh, you know, a locomotive with cars behind it, you would just have the single RDC car. And it used to be able to go push pull. So you could actually run it one way and then just walk to the other side and engineer it going the other way. So you wouldn't even have to turn it around. The problem is, is that at one point it actually hit a logging truck at a grade crossing. And so they had to rebuild one end of it. And basically it could only want run one direction um, so essentially it took a little bit more time for them to turn it around and do that kind of stuff. But the bud card did actually remain in operation until the absolute bitter end when Amtrak came in in 1971. So, and that car does still exist. It's the only, uh, RDC car that SP had number 10. All right. Um, are there any more questions? See, there's some more stuff in the chat. I, I, I can I can stay on also if people want to talk about any of these other questions on here. Most of it is praising you, Sean. So, you know, take, be sure to look <laughs> at the chat before we end. Um, somebody want to know how they can get in contact with you. What's your email address? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and write it right here in the chat. Um, and Josh Buck, he made a comment about the, uh, the gondolas that were in the... Um, in the roadbed and he said something to the effect of um they were a retaining wall is that right josh yeah it was a retaining wall and then um they basically they did this a lot where they actually use rolling stock as like a alternative to building walls and stuff like that um and so the, actually there's that trail that's down there in fortuna they actually um there's box cars all along the river they use it as a retaining wall so that was a pretty common practice um, so yeah, there's my email. It's srmitchell91 at gmail. And then, like I said, um, you can always message us. Um, write that. So the Facebook page is uh, facebook.com slash North Coast Railroad History. And I, I manage that with Josh Buck, who honestly is just as, if not more knowledgeable on this than I am. Uh, we work together on this stuff and we go out and explore and do all sorts of crazy stuff on the railroad. So. 
Any other questions? Yeah, I think it'd be great if it's possible for you to do a layout, a physical layout of what your current capabilities are with your track and what your points are so we can see where you would like to go, where you are and where you can, would like to If you could yeah. do that sometime. Oh, and do you mean for the, the future excursion? Yeah, for the future muted. excursion, for the for the speeder now, and for the I'm future. I'm unmuted, so. Where you have to go. Yeah, so um, I think, yeah, there you go. Um, so right now we do run our speeders from Samoa to Manila, and we did actually clear some of the track into Manila, and the plan is, is to actually get the rails all the way open from basically our shops at Samoa up to the grade crossing, which is the highway over there near like the Mad River Slough Bridge. Um, because those rails have been paved over and it's a lot harder obviously to rebuild something through a highway. But um, the neat thing is that we operate on that trackage and then we also operate from basically where the Adorney Center is all the way up to the mill property across from Harper. And that is, I believe, our longest run now. It's almost five miles round trip. Um, and the rails are in pretty good shape. Uh, the bridges are practically new by railroad terms. Um, that Eureka Slough Bridge is from the 70s, I believe. So it's actually in pretty good shape. Um, but yeah, like I said, that our group has no intention on going from you know anywhere in Eureka South just because it's too cost prohibitive. And we know that the trail is going to happen, and we want to be friends with the people that uh, you know want to build this trail down south. So yeah, thanks, Ben. I had a thanks, comment. Shelley. Yes. I had a, I, uh, I'm 73 years old, and I lived on the main line of Southern Pacific in Richmond, California. Oh, that okay. Car, the Bud car used to be called the Senator, and it ran from Oakland to Sacramento every day, back and forth. I, I think I have actually heard that. Yeah. I personally saw it in, as a nine-year-old kid. That's so cool. Thanks for sharing I wish, that. Um, I wish I would have had a chance to ride it to Eureka. Me too. It's worth noting also, uh, James, that the Bud car actually, um, so when it left the property, I think it went off somewhere else in like Oregon or something, but it ended up finding its way to Texas and it ended up going through Hurricane Katrina and the car actually got flooded pretty much up to like floor level. And because it was salt water, everyone assumed that it was just going to get cut up and scrapped. Uh, they ended up moving it back to California and now it is going to be like the centerpiece of the, it's the Southern Pacific, uh, I think it's called the Heritage, um, I can't remember the exact name of it, but the SP number 10 is gonna have its own home now and they're actually gonna cosmetically restore it. So that's really cool. Okay. All right, any um, other questions? Um, thank you, Sean, for your presentation that was awesome thank you everybody for joining us um so this is going to be a monthly event our next um lecture that we'll be hosting will be um about the sequoia park zoo and that will be on the third of october um if you already get the you've signed up and you already got the emails you're good to go i will send you the links to everything so you know nor don't need to worry about signing up again um I'll also send out an email, um, we recorded this, so as soon as we get the link to a place where we can distribute it, I will um, send an email with that link. So if you wanna go back and revisit it, you can. And I'll be sure to put um, Sean's contact information and the uh, North Coast Railroad history links in that email, so that way it's all in one convenient spot for you. Um, yeah, and so other than that, I think we are gonna wrap up. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, please let me know. You all have my email address. Um, like I said, this is our first time doing it. So we want to make sure that this is as good as we can. So please let us know if there's any way we can improve. And other than that, I guess we'll see you next month. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here. It was fun. Yes, it was. Appreciate it. <laughs> Take care. And thanks for setting it up to Joanne and Corin. Thank you. Yeah, this was a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Fun. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Gonna go ahead and end it for everybody. So here we go. <laughs>